Hello and welcome to Nailing It Down, a supplement for Varnwalk. And today we're talking about the Iron Law of Oligarchy and the German-born Italian sociologist with a French name, uh, Robert Michel, or Robert Michels. Uh, he was born in Cologne in 1876, and he died in 1936 in Rome, Italy. Um, at age 60, during World War II. He was a major figure, actually, in both Italian and German thought, and illustrates, in a lot of ways, the shift of parts of the social democratic movement away from Marxism and, and anarchism and towards, frankly, first national syndicalism and then fascism. His influence on American theory comes through two different ways. Uh, he is a major influence on the thought of James Burnham. After James Burnham quits being a Trotskyist in the mid-1930s, he writes the managerial revolution and the Machiavellians and mentions Robert Michel explicitly, as well as most of the sociologists associated with the Italian elite theory school, and their political allegiance was to Italian fascism in the main. He was a, a pupil of Max Weber. Now, Max Weber was one of the first people to move away from traditional Marxism and try to correct it with a new understanding of class. Uh, and he published his writings in the Archive for Social Research and Social Politics uh, beginning in 1906 and was co-edited um, with Max Weber in 1913, but actually grew, grew to oppose Weber because Michel actually sided with the left faction of the S. Pay Day over World War I. Um, Michel began to criticize um, the materialistic determinism that he saw in Karl Marx, although specifically he thought it was too unicausal that Marx reduced materialism to too simple of an understanding. Now, I think this is a misreading of Marx, but if you read... If you read the literature coming out of the SP Day or later the early Soviets, it is clear that they also dramatically reduced what was meant by Marxist materialistic determinism or historical materialism. He moved to um, the University of Turin and started teaching economics, political science, and social economics. Um, From 1913 to 1914, but then became a professor of economics at the University of Basel, Switzerland, in 1920 until 1928. Um, he was a professor of economics actually at the University of Perugia, which I don't know how to pronounce, I will admit that. Um, during the fascist period in May. 3rd, 1936, when he died. So he, he was a teacher almost his entire life, and he died in the classroom, so to speak. Um, he influenced also the American writer uh, Samuel Martin Lipset, who used his writings to justify the suppression of unions and the purging of communists from the unions um, during the McCarthy period in the United States. What is interesting about Robert Michel is that he picks up many of the same themes of Max Weber and takes them further. He was also synonymous with uh, Werner Sombart, and Sombart is another person who was initially associated with um, with the left, and increasingly was in so was linked to. Um, the right. Um, Zombart defected towards nationalism 
and uh, became sympathetic uh, to National Socialism until 1938, where Sombart uh, wrote an anthropology book clearly criticizing Nazi racial ideologies. But Sombart became a figure of what's called the, the, the German conservative revolutionaries, um, something that I'm also doing a show on with Christopher of Regrettable Century. Um, Sombart is not as important here, although he also becomes an influence on Austrian economics because Sombach coins the phrase creative destruction, which is picked up by the Austrian economist Joseph Schupender. And um, Schupender is an interesting Austrian. Um, so we can see that Robert Michel is actually t entangled in this rightward shift of a lot of the right wing of social democrats. Now, this is the rational core of the thesis that the left produced a lot of fascism. Um, because while fascism was explicitly anti-communist, um, and it was explicitly concessionary towards um, nationalism, it was interesting in that it saw using, uh, it, it, having key, almost Bonapartist figureheads formally represent the state, was a way to present uh, a counterforce to elites capturing various institutions. So Italian fascist in particular, but fascism in general, was both conciliatory towards the right, but also critical of the multi-institutionality of both the liberal right a la Edmund Burke in, in Britain and the blood and soil right of the multi-houses of traditional European monarchies. This is often missed when we discuss it right now. Now, what is interesting about that is while a lot of these key intellectuals who often came from refugee families, uh, Robert Macher definitely did, as did Max Weber, uh, they, they often went through phases. So um, when Weber is young, he's a member of the SP Day. Um, he actually ran as a, as a social democratic candidate. Um, while, while he was teaching at the University of Marburg in his early life, he lost. That was in 1903. In Italy, um, where he immigrated, um, early on, he became associated with the Italian Revolutionary Syndicalist Movement, and particularly the leftist branch of the Italian Socialist Party, which is where most of the, the socialist parties came from, although he left it in 1907. He was to join the fascist party explicitly in 1924 um, and become a director of the Italian Socialist Party's newspaper, Avanti. So he's one of the key intellectuals along with Giovanni Gentile um, of fascism. Now, the, who are the other two intellectuals? I've mentioned the people that he's associated with Germany. He's also associated with uh, Villafredo Pareto, um, who is one of the foundational thinkers of how you have governing elites and non-governing elites, and Galteno Mosca, who also was interested in the political class and the non-political class and the elites among them both. Um, Michel has probably the simplest but most articulated theory in his Iron Law of Oligarchy. This he articulated before he was a fascist in 1910 in a book called Political Parties. Now, he would go so far to say that whoever says organization says oligarchy because, who, because Robert Michel actually believed that many tendencies of both technical, uh, tactical and technical necessity created multiple elites within an organization, even if those organizations were initially founded very democratically. According to Michelle, almost all organizations need bureaucrats in a leadership class, and they function as paid administrators, executives, spokesperson, and strategists for the organization. 
they are often in the beginning servants of the masses, but they also become a self-organizational uh, coup. They grow to dominate the organization's power structure because they have the knowledge of how the organization's power structures work. They often also engage in what someone like Max Weber would call skills capture. So they can hoard skills, giving them the, the only ability to run many of the functions of the organization. If they are concerned about being efficient, they will try to centralize their power. Um, and Michelle says, ap apathy, indifference, and non-participation of most rack and file members who are basically um, uh, free riders enabled this as well as um increasingly the the initial founders and those who set up the bureaucratic structures being able to punish those who oppose them in the decision making process michelle argues that democratic attempts to re-democratize these org these organizations or hold these people accountable are prone to fail because the powerful can, can reward both loyalty and skills to those who are loyal to them and control information within the organization. All these mechanisms can be used to, to strongly influence the outcome of even properly democratic members. In other words, you don't need to fix elections or have open slate voting for this to happen. Um. Michelle thought that the goal of, of eliminating elite rule was impossible and that elected parliamentary democracy was a, fa was a facade uh, legitimizing the rule of particular elites in particular circumstances, thus oligarchies. Michelle would later actually endorse the fascist party because he believed that having a strongly elected central leadership could be a counterbalance to these elites. And since the elites were inevitable and there was no such thing as a true class politics, a more integralist um, view of the state would lead to elites having the interest of different factions of society uh, represented and that a strong central leader could negotiate between these elite factions. All right. Now... There's a lot of reasons for this. I mean, he talks about bureaucracy being needed to maintain complex infrastructure. He talks about the need to run communication between large central groups. And he talks about the need to have increasingly specialized skills to make sure technology and other means are, are done. So he thinks that bureaucratization and specialization result in the IR of law of uh, of oligarchy and then that hierarchical school organization is a way to rationalize and routinize authority and decision making processes um a process described by max Weber, but also assumed even by leftist economists in america such as john kenneth galbraith and um this is also the logic behind the peter principle which is the logic that people get promoted until they fail um bureaucracy by design leads to centralization of power within leaders um, and this seems to simplify or manage the complexity of the organization. There are, however, examples against this. So the examples for it are labor unions, which develop coteries of professional workers who eventually are no longer from, from the workers. Um, and they have leadership that is basically hired on. Um, um, university student unions are shown to have this problem where you have, you know, um, strong freedom of information and engaged student community and, uh, and independent student media have a tendency towards hierarchy. But according to at least uh, a couple uh, study by Titus Gregory could also be pushed against. He studied the Canadian Federation of Students saying these other tendencies could push back against oligarchy, preventing it from becoming consolidated. What we discover 
is that countervailing powers actually do mitigate the iron law of, of oligarchy, as does technologies which facilitate skill sharing versus skill hoarding. All right, so I talked a lot about skills hoarding and skill sharing and selectively skill sharing being one of the ways in which coteries and groups can become oligarchies within an organization without ever formally even being elected to do so. And even if they are, they can control how people stay loyal to them by sharing those skills, right? Well, if you have general shill scaring, it actually increases uh, freedom of information and the ability for people to do things and decreases the ability for people to use skills capture our institutional knowledge capture to play the system to their benefit. Uh, a lot of cybernetic theory also, particularly the work of Stafford Beer, is based off of preventing um, the need for bureaucratization and thus the need and thus the development of, of oligarchies by sharing information through simple means. Right, it's based off the Codona system. I've done episodes on that, um, and it you can share information between groups, and those groups can can have provisional roles, which emerge as a function of what is needed to be done. So you still have division of labor or whatnot, but they're temporary and pulled back, as you see in relatively simple societies. What Michelle argues is that complex societies make this impossible. Simple societies, this is possible, but there are ways in which modern technology actually does replicate the conditions and knowledge availability of simpler societies. Which is to say, there does seem to be outs for the iron law of oligarchy. Um, even in 1947, Adolf Gasser um, argued that societies, because they emerge from the bottom up and the top comes later, uh, people who can join local communities and those communities can form counter institutions and have relatively uh, ca secure financial independence, they can determine rules to combat elites. Local communities can join together to form higher units like cantons and thus hierarchical bureaucracy is not necessary and hierarchy between levels of government, our levels of organization is provisional. And thus competition between local communi communities, I uh, services, liver and taxes, a uh, cut against the capture and support of an elite. Now, if this sounds like it's very conducive towards free market, it's it's not not surprising that it came out in German in 1947 and 1943, right? Um If a lot of this sounds interesting and similar to you, it is because you've heard it in George Orwell. George Orwell's theory um, that he that he has of the theory and practice of oligarchical collectivism, which is kind of a a, a, a simplification of Trotskyism, has a lot of James Burnham in it deliberately. And in fact, uh, when Orwell wrote several articles on Burnham. He talked about this explicitly, um, saying they pulled from Burnham, even though he's critiquing Burnham at the time. And since Burnham is pulling from Robel Michels, it shows up as a kind of cynical theory of which uh, Goldstein is portraying to, you know, to break the, the, the oligarchy of the party who are an administrative captured elite. All right. Now, if this sounds similar to stuff like modern PMC theory, it's because modern PMC theory does pull from many of these sources, both Weber, uh, C. Wright Mills, who, whose power elite was a critique of this, but also accepted a lot of these assumptions. Um, uh, it's in James Burnham. And people like Aaron Reich were pulling on Marxist literature and looking at the development of new classes and subclasses, which I believe are really stratum because they're not as coherent as presented in that book, particularly now. But nonetheless, are kinds of oligarchies that exist at different levels of society that cartelize power, engage in skill shows, et cetera. The reason why it's important for socialists and leftists in general 
to understand this concept is there is it is considered to be provisionally true that Michelle is more or less correct. Um, since 1953, most sociologists have agreed that there's a high de degree of general credibility, but that Michelle didn't state his uh, his theory was not stated adequately enough and uh, doesn't provide enough examples. And there are good counterexamples um, against what Michelle was arguing. Also, Michelle was the first person to really use the development of elites within the SP day as an example, and this still comes up to this day. Um, but there are other theorists like uh, Josiah Ober, who in his book, Democracy and Knowledge, for example, shows that ancient Athens and other direct democratic societies where people had more skin in the game uh, did not actually have oligarchical tendencies in the same way that Michelle describes. And in fact, um, they often outperformed hierarchical rivals despite being a participatory democracy. Although there's huge caveats to that because Ober, you know, realizes, but doesn't make a big deal of the fact that all the societies are slave societies and that, that even the participatory democratic spirit is of a relatively small group of people in ancient Athens. Um, so, in so much, however, that you have an organization that is highly bureaucratized, what Robert Michel says does generally hold true. And so, as socialists and people who don't want class development, we have to understand this so we can prevent it from happening, which means organizing in ways that are, that are not highly bureaucratic. However, given our dependence on, on a lot of prior state forms, we tend to, to create systems that are highly bureaucratic and thus are given to these tendencies. Notice that the tendencies that fight against them, such as, say, Mao and the Cultural Revolution are Robert Michel's conception of fascism, the idea of a central Bonapartist-like figure as a check on bureaucrat um, bureaucratizing elites is common. And it's even a common appeal way back in the Middle Ages. So, for example, um, the king playing peasant discontent off of the lords to keep lords from being powerful uh, oppositions to him and any one power is actually, I mean, any one polity is actually pretty common. So you'll see kings appeal to the abuse of the peasants, even though they didn't give a crap about the peasants and they would execute them on a whim, but they will play them off as a, as a counter base uh, against the elite lords and their specific captures so that they can consolidate the national rule in one person. All right. So this is uh, the, the, the counter check to oligarchical collectivism or to oligarchical tendencies is Bonapartism or, or, you know, tyrannical development. Now, what I find ironic about this, if you look at like Aristotle's description of the constitution, Robert Michel seems like he's just trying to mathematically prove what already was general ground rules of assumption for most of European organization going all the way back to Aristotle. But like I said, there is evidence that there are ways out of this. Cybernetic theory, highly engaged counter institutions, um, uh, skill share, not allowing skills capture to develop, uh, Things becoming roles and not positions. So people having to, this is why sortition is often used. So those of you who don't know what sortition is, is where you randomly give away like political organizations of people because, and you can recall them, but no one is, no one even runs for it. It's given away randomly and everybody's expected to serve because uh, you don't want anyone being able to develop skills hoarding in that position since it's political and not technical it doesn't even do you much good and if you do you create a class by doing it all right so i hope you learned a lot from this i'm gonna put some reading into the bait and this is one of the few times i'm gonna put some sources from wikipedia because i have been reading on this for 10 years and it's a lot now I'm going to do some podcast business right now. I need to thank all my new con Ilkahanans, and there's a lot of you. Um, so I had a lot of people in the last couple of months become 
ten dollar a month donors um or more and so i want to thank them all now that is kelly i tunguska event b albini dan h zachary h zuza alex p wv sutra michael n bucket three ben w and kelly i I'd like to thank you for your support you make this possible um for those who are interested for just three bucks, you can get everything audio. So I provide free audio of about three-fourths of the free shows on the channel with some additional shows that are audio only that are free. But if you subscribe, you get all the interviews, you get all the nailing it down, you get all the barn blog solos and nailing it down about barn blog solos audios are not released to the public. You also get the full episode of Diving Into Wreckage with Sean KB of Antifada, you get um, the full episode of Parallax Vlog um, with um, uh, JG Michaels from Parallax Views, and you enable me to continue collaborating with both Strange Matters Magazine and our Strange Matters Monthly Supplement Interview and with No Royal Road, with the Regrettable Century guys, um, and our Marxist readings of history, um, as well as enabling us to continue doing um, gaming materialist with uh, TIR's Gene Bajalon and the upcoming Nailing It Down Nationalism series, which I am going to make some reading lists for for my patrons and patrons are already asking for them. I haven't done it yet. I will do it. Um, thank you for all your support. And I hope you have a great day. Um, I am pre-recording all of these pretty far ahead of time because by, by the time this will be released, I will be in a show. Um, actually probably the day this is released in LA and my birthday is coming up. And so after the show, I'm going to be taking a little bit of time off, but there will be a series of these made available for you. Um, mostly nailing it down episodes that I've been promising topics on, and I hope you enjoy them. Have a great day.